Alright, what's going on you guys? It's a Wednesday evening and uh, I have discovered some interesting shit in here. Let's have a look at this Ground Zero massive piece of hunk of junk and see what the issue is here. So, this is the old Ground Zero 10K. It's the higher, it's the higher voltage one. It's the one that does like um, 10K at 18 volts. Um, it does about 8K at 14 volts. So it's, uh, yeah, it's basically an 8K amplifier here. We're using 500 volt FETs on the output section because it is a 18 volt rated amplifier. And we're using uh, 064Ns on the power supply. It uses this classic standard uh, IRF 21844S driver board, which looks like this. You've got the four IRS 21844S drive chips on, on there like so. And uh, now I'm going to put my hat on for this so you guys can see what's going on. So, the repair on this amplifier was quite horrific. Uh, I've had to do quite a bit of work on this to get it up and running to where it is now. Um, some um, repairs I have made include the muting transistors here, just by the driver board. Um, there were some of these green inductors that were failed as well. Uh, whilst I wait for new resistors to arrive in the mail, um, I have um, used two 10 ohms. So these basically are 5 ohm source resistors for the high side and one of these was dead uh, but I didn't, I didn't have any um, 5 ohm resistors laying around so I used two 10 ohm resistors in parallel to give me a 5 ohm so that will swap out for the correct size resistor when it arrives in the mail but just for testing purposes that's no problem it works exactly the same as it should do um, we had a blown output section completely blown all the FETs out and it blew the driver board pretty badly as well. The driver board was very badly damaged and this is partly what I'm going to be showing you today. So if we take a look at our zoom in cam, I will show you the driver board here and the repairs that we have made so far. So this amplifier is quite far into the repair process already. I, I'm this, I, I, I've done most of this already but I wanted to show you this um, from the start, uh, from, 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 the, from the bit that I found here with, with, with a couple of issues. So, the driver board, when it was um, when it when the amplifier came in blown, we had four blown drive ICs which were quite visibly blown. They had little holes in them and burnt marks, etc. We had blown bootstrap diodes here, and also a couple of these small capacitors for the high side were also shorted. So we re we replaced the four diodes, and I went ahead and replaced all four capacitors as well. I noticed that. If I look closely above the drive IC, there are some very small resistors and capacitors here above the ICs. I'm going to try and zoom in even more. I don't know if it will stay in focus this close. Maybe it will. So you see that there are a bunch of small resistors and capacitors just above the drive ICs. And these resistors were actually all burned out. So these 103s, these are 10,000. Uh, ohm resistors. These were all blackened and I didn't know the values but I could just go ahead and check to the other side and it would tell me. So these are 10,000 ohm resistors so I went ahead and dropped in some replacement 10,000 ohm resistors over this side. Now what I should have probably thought about is what these resistors do. These resistors, a couple of these resistors, are connected to pin number four of the drive IC when that you can see the dot there you go one two three four to pin number four and if you look on the data sheet for the IRS 21844S you'll notice that pin four is responsible for programming the dead time now dead time is the amount of off time on the on the square wave so if you think about the um, the drive wave being a square it starts off off and goes on off on off well it's not always a perfect um, equal sine wave sometimes the on time will be shorter than the off time and the off time will be shorter than the on time um, and that is dead time the dead time controls and programs how much time the wave is dead in between the pulses yeah so if you think about the drive wave being a section of pulses the dead time is the time when it's off so these resistors and capacitors are responsible for programming the dead time for this. So because we had one half of the driver board here with these resistors for the dead time were smoked up um, I, uh, and the other side was not, I replaced these resistors but I probably should have also thought about the fact that the capacitors that are next to them might have also been quite badly damaged. So the capacitors which are is this little white one here, tiny baby white one here, 
and this tiny baby white one here are also part of the dead time program circuit. So these will also, the value of these capacitors will determine the dead time of the amplifier. I haven't changed these yet because I didn't think that they would be dead. I've never seen that before. I've never ever seen the dead time control circuit get burnt in these. Um, so when I, re when I made my, my repairs to the driver board, um, I thought, okay, cool, driver board is repaired. Um, I checked the rest of the board, I made my repairs elsewhere that I needed to, and I thought, okay, cool, let's go ahead and fire this baby up with some new FETs in. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the amplifier turning on and what happens at the moment. You can notice I've removed pretty much all of the rail capacitors. Okay, you can see here that I've only got two left. Actually, these are partly rail capacitors as well, but we ignore those for now. I've only left two main rail capacitors left in the board. And the reason for this is because this amplifier has a problem where when the amplifier turns on, the FETs, they, they, they drain all of the rail, rail uh, energy, the rail current, through the FETs the second that the class D switch comes into action. And so when that happens, obviously the MOSFETs are under a massive strain because they are quickly dumping like 120 volts through them and they get very hot very quickly. So the way to, obviously in order to work out what the issue is, I was needing to turn the amplifier on and off, on and off multiple times in order to see the drive waves when it dumps the current through the FETs where it shouldn't be doing. And so in order to do that without risking damaging the FETs, by removing almost all of the rail capacitors, I significantly reduce the amount of energy that goes through the FETs when the issue presents itself and it dumps the current through the FETs. Oh, I mean, look, there's what, there's six, um, there's 12 capacitors here and I've only got two left. So I, I only have two twelfths of the power left that is going to be dumped through the FETs when this issue happens. So that's very safe, they're not going to explode like they might may have done if I'd have left all 12 in. So that's why I've removed the rail caps. Um, so let's take, take our oscilloscope here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take probe number one and the FETs that get hot are the low side FETs on this side. So if you think this is the amplifier's um, class, D, uh, class D section here. And what we have is we have the bank split up into high side and low side. That's how the class D works. It drives a high side and a low side FET. So you have a bank of high sides here, three high sides. And then so the, the, this, is, this is one sort of section. Yeah? This is split up into four sections. You've got on the driver board, you've got four drivers. And then you've got four inductors and four banks of output that all kind of work together. So you've got this little, this little corner here. This is one bank. And you've got two, three, and four. So each bank has a high side and a low side. So the high side are these three, and the low side are these three on this bank. On this bank, the low side are these three, and the high side are these three. So we have high, high, low, and low in sets of three that are in parallel. And the same on the other side, high, high, low, and low. The ones that were getting hot, the FETs that were actually dumping the current through them, were the six low side FETs over this side of the board. Now if we take a look at our driver board here, the side that had the dead time damage was this side, this side of the driver board, okay? And when we slot that into the board, that then references this side of outputs. So the side that had the bad dead time um, resistors was this side. So I'm going to take probe number one, I'm going to probe the drain of the low side FET, which will show us the square wave on the oscilloscope up here. I'm going to take the other probe and probe the other side. And we're going to take a look on our scope, if I turn my settings on so we can see both of these waves here. Okay, so I'm going to put uh, probe number one and probe number two both on the same, so they're, they're on the same screen, um, so we should be able to see what happens when we turn the amplifier on. So if I go ahead and flick my power supply on, make sure that my remote, remote wire is connected up, and we're going to go, oops, what's that in the way of my, there we go, so you can see there I've got the voltage. 9.8 volts because that's a much safer voltage to use to work on the amplifier and this is the current draw from the amplifier as we turn it on. So without further ado let's hit the remote and I'll show you what happens. Did you see that? So that is a tiny little blip glitch 
and that should have been a big nice fat square wave that continues to work continuously um, and you know makes amplifier work so let's do that one more time okay so that is what the amplifier is currently doing when you try and turn it on that glitch there is as a result of the rail voltage being dumped through the FETs and you can see this happen if we change where our, our scope is probed to so we're going to put probe number one on the low voltage rail and probe number two on the high voltage rail watch what happens to the wave to the to the rail voltages when we try and turn the amplifier on and you'll see them they they get completely drained back down to zero as soon as the thing tries to come into operation see that it's like boom so all of that energy in the capacitors is dumped through the MOSFETs and is drained down to zero volts. And then the power supply goes and tries to charge them up again, gets dumped through the FETs, tries again, gets dumped through the FETs, tries again, gets dumped through the FETs in a cycle that just continuously heats up these low side FETs over here. So why is it doing that? Why is it doing that? There could be a whole number of reasons that that's happening. Um, uh, could be a shorted inductor on the output section. It could be a bad drive. One of these sides isn't being driven correctly, for example. Um, however, I have gone through this board um, and I have removed the um, the drive uh, pins from the header for the driver board, and I have confirmed that the drivers and the drive waves going to all of these MOSFETs are perfect. So it's not a drive related issue I believe like it's not a drive wave related issue it's not, it's not a driver IC related issue it's not like one of the drive ICs isn't turning on or there's a shorted drive IC or anything like that so the actual drive ICs themselves are working properly um, the inductors it could be a shorted inductor however uh, I did check all the inductors as well so my next thing in trying to work out what was wrong with this amplifier was okay so the drive waves are good I know that they're okay we, I checked the rest of the amplifier section with my multimeter in terms of resistors and other capacitors and all sorts of inductors and things like that to make sure that there was nothing else shorted, which there wasn't. So my next course of action it would be, okay, let's remove the inductors from the circuit completely and see whether the drive circuit will turn the FETs on and off correctly without dumping current through them. So the inductors are these things on the board and these filter out the class D switching wave to prevent it from going to the speaker terminals. So by removing these from the circuit, not actually removing them from the board, because you don't have to do that, if you just lift one of the legs of each of these inductors, then this disconnects them from the board and the circuit it doesn't, doesn't see that they're there. So we can go ahead and remove these entirely from the board, from the circuit. So now when we power the amplifier up, we will, um, the, the, you know, we'll see what happens here. So let's do this one more time and let's change where our probes are. Let's put them back on the low side drain like this. So we are looking at the resulting wave that, that, go, that, that gets put onto the, uh, the rail voltages as a result of it being driven over here. So let's apply the power and see what she looks like. Okay, so um, yeah, that's really strange. So what we have on the screen is we have obviously probe number one and probe number two overlapped over each other. Um, so the waves don't look equal, do they? They look like they're doing different things here. So let's go ahead and do that again, but this time just to get a clearer view of what's going on, I'm actually gonna separate the um, probes one and two slightly from each other so that we can see each individual wave clearer. There we go. So you can see there that on uh, probe number, I think it's, so probe number one, which is the side that didn't have the dead time control damaged. You can see there that the dead time is like so. And the other side, the dead time is like so. So the, the dead time is not equal between these two. But it does look equal if you it does look equal. The dead time on the, the dead time on that one seems to match the uptime of this one. Um, but anyway, I don't think this is correct. I think that, that we have a dead time problem here. So when now, now because these are the two low side drains, right? These are the two low side drains. They go through the inductor. Okay, the induct the it, they go through the inductors and they they meet in the middle. So at the moment, at the moment, each bank of four. Each, each 
each separate kind of corner of this class D amplifier is separated from each other. So the wave that comes off of out of these FETs, that comes off of this, this inductor, isn't connected to this inductor, which isn't connected to this inductor, which isn't connected to this inductor. As soon as we put them in the board, all of these waves merge with each other. You see? They all become part of the same output. And this is this this wave is what the audio signal rides along. So the, 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 the purpose of the inductor is to get rid of this big R square wave and just leave you with an audio signal. So what's gonna happen if we merge this inductor which has one of these waves on it with this inductor which has another one of these waves on it well when we put them both in the board together what's going to happen is whilst this big one is still turned on and this other one small one turns off this big one being turned on is going to dump the current from the rail voltage through the ones that have just turned off because they're now off this is what I think is happening anyway. This is, this, is, this is the first time I've seen this. So in my head, this is kind of my current theory on what's going on. So I think that these waves should be the same dead time. And that the reason that the, the current is getting dumped through the low side FET is because one side of these is being left on for too long. And whilst it's on, all of the, the voltage that it's putting out because it's being left on is going through to the other side. So let's just have a think about that for a minute. If that was correct, then the ones that are getting hot are over this side, okay? And the ones that are getting hot over this side are on the purple probe, which is probe number one, and probe number one is the shorter one. So these ones are turning off first, which means that the ones over this side are turning on they're staying on longer, they're turning off seconds. So that would make sense that the power that these ones are creating is being shoved backwards through these vets and thus causing them to heat up and the rails to both sink down to zero volts. That is my analogy. I don't know if we're correct on that, but that is what I have discovered so far on this. So the way that I think that we're gonna be able to resolve this is by taking our driver board out and what we're going to have to do is I'm going to go ahead and block replace, batch replace all of these resistors and capacitors along here. So you see we've got um, these, these small tiny capacitors which are responsible for dead time, the resistors here, and we have these other capacitors here. Now, fortunately, I just so happen to have a very similar driver board that, that, I, that is brand new that works. So this, this is a, a 4IC driver board, and I have another driver board which is a very similar one it's from a different amplifier it's a different size and has a different number of pins but it is the same basic circuit you can see there it's exactly the same drive circuit right down to right down to this stuff it's exactly the same it does use very slightly different value resistors so I imagine that this driver board will give the amplifier a different operating frequency or something perhaps than the original one but I'm thinking if we take all of the components from this driver board and put them onto this one in terms of the dead time control area then any differences between these components due to being damaged should iron themselves out so that's my logical thing that I am going to try in getting this amp up and running. All right, so let's see whether that has made any difference then. Okay, ready? Let's see what happens. What, what do we reckon? Do you think it's gonna be different or do you think it's gonna be the same? I got a feeling it might be the same because I think it's gonna be one of those evenings. Have you ever used the soldering tweezers? Yeah, I find them a bit of a nightmare to be honest. Um, I've never got on with them too well. They just take forever. 
I mean, there may be some soldering tweezers that are better than others, and I've just not used very good ones, but I didn't really get on with them very well. Okay, let's hit this and see what it does. Ah, it's the same. Ah. Okay, well, it's either the same because that's how it's supposed to be, or it's the same because it needs the resistors replacing as well. So let's replace all the resistors to be exactly the same, just to be on the safe side. And then if it's still the same again, then I'll assume that my hypothesis is completely incorrect and that is how it's supposed to be. I want some 103s. One of the IC's dead time is off, either dead time, resistor, or IC. Are the signals going into each IC identical and timed right? Uh, could also be the input filtering components. Interesting. So, uh, Nicholas, the, the thing that's making me wonder um, what's going on here, so obviously we've got four ICs, so four separate dead time things that could be happening. So, um, on the amplifier, there's obviously four different there's, you know, each driver drives, this is one, two, three, four reference to the drivers. So if it was like a, a resistor or a capacitor that was a problem, the thing is, is that we've got identical dead time on these two and identical dead time on these two. So it'd be very strange for, for example, these, the drivers on these two to both be exhibiting the same problems. You know, you would have thought it'd be more random than that. It would just be one bank perhaps, or like, one bank over this side or whatever, but it's not. It's it's literally perfectly symmetry in terms of like the issue is on both banks this side and not on this side, for example. Okay, cool. Let's give it power and see what it's doing. Oops, I keep changing that. Okay, so the dead time is still different. Ah, that's really strange. Okay, so there's nothing more that I can change on the driver board there. So just to just to confirm that, you know, just out of, out of pure interest to see if that did actually do anything, let's just temporarily put the inductors back on the back in the board. Let's make a temporary connection with the inductors. Sorry, if we probe the uh, the positive and negative rail, you'll see we've got the two rails there. Ah and two rails there and you can see that they get further apart and in just a moment you'll see that they get drained through the through the FETs as soon as the amp tries to turn on. Yup! So yeah the amplifier still has the same problem as before. As soon as it tries to go into operation both positive and negative rails get drained, they, they get dumped through the FETs. So yeah. DC on the modulator. Let's take, a, let's take a cheeky look at the modulator. So if I remove the inductors from the circuit once again, so that we can hold the amplifier on so that it powers up fully and doesn't, doesn't drain the, uh, the, the rails through the FETs. Um, let's take a look at our modulator um, output from, so basically the driver board has a pin, which is the output of the, of the modulator. So if we probe that, we should be able to see if there's any DC on there or what's going on with that. So let's turn our, our scope to, um, to a much, much lower voltage, down at say five volts, divide, and let's turn the amplifier on, and I'm gonna probe one of these pins in here, which should be the modulator. So I'm gonna put you back on the scope view, uh, so we can see what the modulator output looks like, and see if there's any DC on there, or if there's any DC to the input of this driver board. I can't remember which pin is which on this driver board though, so. Okay, so there is some DC there, but uh, I can't remember which pin that is. I think this might be the, uh, this isn't the modulator pin, I don't think. That's the positive 15 volts on that one. Uh, there we go, that's the modulator. Let's clean that up a little bit. It's got a bit of noise on it, but it's probably just to do with my, the way my scope's grounded. Um, so that's the modulator output. Looks like look like it looks like it's not 100% um, 50 50 there. It's not a, not a 50 50. There is a quite a bit of noise on that. 
I think there's there's a lot of noise on, on this as a whole actually, so I think there's just noise on the uh, power rails and the way that my scope is grounded. So we're going to ignore those spikes there for just a moment, um, and we're just going to look at the square waves as if they were clean. Uh, so we've got a 64, 65 uh, kilohertz wave on the modulator output, we've got our negative 5 volts, we've got our, uh, what's that, that looks like the audio input perhaps. Um, positive 5 volts and then that might be ground. So I don't think we've got any DC on the um, speaker input. I just had a quick thought, one thing that I want to try. I've had it on occasion where these amplifiers don't like being turned on without the RCA sister board attached. And it's to do with the audio input. So I'm going to go ahead and just slide the, um, the board for the RCA input on and just, just in case for some weird reason this amplifier doesn't like being powered up without this board present. Most of the time it doesn't, it doesn't care, but just because I'm slowly running out of ideas, let's give it a go. Okay, so that, there's no change there that looks exactly the same as it did before. Um, they, do, they do they look like mirrored mirrored inverted copies of each other um, so I in my in my mind they should be the same but I'm not entirely sure because I haven't actually done this strange thing before where you remove all the inductors and you look at the uh, the outputs of the uh, high of the uh, of the uh, low side FET there so what I'd quite like to do is get a smaller amplifier that is easy and quick to take apart that I can actually confirm this with. Um, see if I've got another amplifier somewhere uh, that uses this drive circuit that I can just quickly remove the legs of the inductors from and see how it's meant to work. Uh, I'm just going to go take a quick look at my bench over here. Okay, whew, this was buried very far down. Okay. This board was buried way down low. So this is the actual amplifier board that we used in the um, video that I did, British Girl Tries Fixing Car Audio Amplifier. So that was Ashley. So Ashley repaired most of this with my assistance. Um, and the thing that we're waiting for on this one is a, a spare inductor, which I haven't actually come around to rewinding yet. As you can see, I still have the uh, donut, the core here, ready to rewind. Haven't done that yet, but no worries because the whole point of this exercise is that we are not needing inductors for this for this purpose. So let's go ahead and fire this board up. And I'm just going to put some foam in between the two boards in case there's anything conductive that will short out. Um, and uh, let's fire this one up and let's take a look at the uh, class D outputs from the two different sides. And if they're the same, then we know that that's the issue that we're looking for on this ground zero. However, if they are different, then we know that we're just barking up the wrong tree here. Okay, so yes, the inductor is removed. I'm just making sure that this is going to come on and not explode. I haven't removed anything from it or like to use it as a donor or I haven't accidentally done anything weird with it whilst it's been sitting on my desk waiting for new parts. No, it looks all good to me. The drivers are all there. There we go. Okay, so yes, it is actually the same. The only reason it looks slightly different then is because on one side I was probing the high side uh, gate and on the other side I was probing the low side drain. So if we probe the same ones on each side now this time, And I'm just going to separate the two slightly from each other so that you can see it easier. So you've got the two waves slightly separated from each other. There we go. So Nicholas is right. Yeah, they should be exactly the same uh, phase and dead time. So the fact that they're not on our ground zero amplifier is the problem. Which isolates it to the driver board, I think. The only other thing I can think of is that I might have screwed up with the placement of of these transistors at the top here. So we've got 
A 2A, a 2D, yes, that's correct. An MAX, yes, that's correct. And in 1A, yep, and then a 2D and an MAX. Yeah, so the transistor placement is, is correct at the top there. So if we take a closer look at this driver board, maybe we can see what's going on with the circuit here. So uh, yeah, we have the drive ICs, and the parts that I replaced earlier on in today's live stream were what controls the dead time of the chip. So this is the chip here. Why is it out of focus? Maybe it can't focus in that close. That's a bit better. So the chip here, we have the uh, IRS2844S or the FAN7393A. Pin number four, which is this little pin, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four. This little pin here is connected to this resistor up here and this capacitor here. And these two work together to set the dead time for this drive IC. So we've replaced but all of all of these actually fuck it we, we've, we've batch replaced all of these components at the top here for all of these both on this side and both on this side uh, so the only thing left to perhaps do is just to I mean I've replaced all these capacitor all these diodes as well and these capacitors here but I could replace them again and replace the drive ICs again once more and um, I don't know what else to change it. I mean, the, uh, the the generation circuit, the PWM generation, is done here in, in the center of the board. And what we've got here is we've got a um, a a, uh, a 072C a LM211 and a 393 or a 293. So the 293 is to do with protection. I don't think we need to worry about that just now. So we've got an 072C and a 211. Um, so I could try replacing those in case it's something that's wrong between those. But if there was a problem between those, then the same issue would appear on both sides of the board, I think. And because it's not appearing on both sides of the board, I don't think that it's in the generation. I think it's in something to do with the way that it's splitting it to either side. Um, and interestingly, the only difference is between the sides of the board. So this, this is this is one side of the board, and this is the other side of the board. This this references here. So like this side of the board is responsible for like for example this side, and the other side, this side of the board is responsible for this side. So the only differences between these circuits on the driver board is that we've got over here this transistor up here. This transistor is a 1A, and the transistor on the other side is a 2A. That is the only differences between these two sides of circuit. Signals on the drive input. Okay, so yes, pin number one of the IRS21844S, or the FAN in this case, um, is the input, the PWM input for the chip so that needs to be perfectly in phase square waves with each other in order for the thing to work properly so let's turn it on and let's check that they are in phase square waves so i'm going to turn my divide down on my scope so we can see this better um, so let's probe pin number one of this drive i see we need to do this very carefully uh, so as not to uh, Right, okay, there's a problem, don't they look damn different from one another, don't they look damn different from one another, eh? Okay, so, that's a something. Okay, what I might have to do then is I'm actually probably going to have to probe this first carefully while the amp is off. To, like hold it steady, turn the amp on and turn it off again. Because otherwise if I slip with my probe whilst it's on, it's game over. Okay, so I'm going to call this IC number four. Number four is on the far right hand side and IC one is on the far left hand side. So I'm probing pin number one, which is the PWM input of IC number one. Let's store this to memory. 
So let's go ahead and store that trace to memory. So I'm going to go to trace, memory one, save to memory one. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and turn that trace on so that it's always there on the screen. Now I'm going to move the position of this down out of the way a little bit. Actually, no, fuck it. Let's leave it where it was. And let's probe the input of IC number two. Sorry, number uh, IC. I'm going backwards, aren't I? From four. So let's. So we just did four. So let's probe the IC input of number three. Okay, that looks identical. So that's probably probably fine. Now let's move over to IC number two and let's probe that one. This is where it starts getting really awkward with my hand. Ugh. What the fuck? It's completely different. It's like twice the size. It's twice the size and completely different. So which one is wrong? The small one or the big one? Yeah, so huh, H1 Nicholas at Bear Vids problem 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 hashtag Bear Vids problem. So yeah, number two and number one both exhibit the same problem. So I just I just measured two and one both, and they both look the same. So that is our difference in in things that are happening here. So let's actually probe uh, 1A and 2A. So I'm going to get rid of this trace on the on the screen here. Trace memory off. Uh, so let's let's go and probe the 1A and 2A on the driver board and see if that's where that wave originates from. Okay, possibly. So yeah, it looks like we've got on uh, on pins one and three of the 1A, it looks like this. And if we go to the 2A over this side, without electrocuting myself. Okay, so the uh, 2A looks pretty good as well. Okay, so that's distributing the, uh, the signal wave just fine. Let's check the two Ds. Whoa. So the two Ds, we've got that, that, and that. And over this side, on the two D, we've got that, whatever the fuck that is, that, and that. Okay, so the, the problem wave starts on pin two of the two D over this side. So it could be the 2D that is the problem, or it could be something that's feeding the 2D with whatever that wave is. Um, so just so you guys can see the bits I'm talking about there. So we've got our drive ICs here, okay, and the inputs to the drive ICs are on pin number one, which is this pin here, which has the little dot next to it. Pin one is here. So this is the input to the, to the IC. Uh, and it seems that the input to the IC appears to be connected to pin number two of the 2D transistor up here and up here. It appears that we have the 1A over here and 2D, sorry, 1A and 2A transistors, which are, this. Th that's where the wave is coming from, from the, the PWM generation circuit up here. But, that <coughs> but then it seems to get buffered perhaps by these 2Ds. So it could be a 2D that is faulty up here and here because we have a bad looking output on this 2D but a good looking output on this 2D. So it's either a resistor value that's wrong or it's the 2Ds that's, that's bad. So let's go ahead and check some resistor values up here on the top of the board. So there's some resistors around this section of the board. So we've got uh, 820, It's 
put it on to a resistance setting here just for a minute. Ah, there we go. Hang on a minute. There's a difference here. There is a difference. I think I might have found it. All right. So if we check on the resistors here, okay. So actually, yeah, let's, let's take this board. So on this board, there are a couple of resistors that are next to the 2D transistors. So we've got this resistor here, which appears to be a, what is it? A 800 ohm. Roughly there or thereabouts. The light is terrible in here. But my multimeter is just like blinded. So yeah, this resistor appears to be like 817 or something. And if we measure that one on the other side of the board, we also have the same resistance, okay? So now let's go ahead and crank that up a bit and let's measure the resistor which is next to that on the good side. Uh, oops, wrong one. 2.35, okay? And that is um, 2.35. This I need to zoom out a little bit here so you can see the whole board. So that's 2.35, 2.36. This one, however, over here is way, way over. So I think that resistor's gone open. Let's check our donor board and see what the resistances are on that one. 2.42, 2.42, well there we go, there's a difference, there is a resistor that's not reading correctly, so that could be our problem, we have an open resistor on the driver board, so let's go ahead and replace those resistors, I'm going to swap all four of them out just to be on the safe side because they obviously got, um, you know, got in some shit up there. So let's replace all four of those resistors and see whether it sorts itself out. Nicholas gives us some really good information. Totem pole sources and sinks current. That resistor forms part of the totem pole driver. Okay, that's a, that's a lesson there from Nicholas. I didn't know that. So that's pretty interesting. I might have to go and do some reading on totem pole um, circuits now. So I understand that a bit better. Okay, so now we've replaced the resistor that appeared to be open. Let's go ahead and power it back on and see whether the um, dead time is still wrong or if it's now the same. I'm really hoping that this is the same now because this is one of the last ideas I have. Uh, but we are making progress and we are finding problems, so that's good. As long as we're always finding problems, then that's always good. <laughs> All right, let's give her a crack, give her a whirl, see what happens. Oh, <laughs> screw up! Boom! In your face! That was perfect. They were in phase because it looked like one trace, and there was no, there was nothing wrong with that. That looks really fucking good. Okay. Boom. So I should be able to reconnect the inductors and that should work fine now. Okay, so that is the inductors soldered temporarily back to the board. I'm gonna do them properly in a minute if this works. And um, so yeah, the only thing left to do now is to fire it up and make sure it works properly with all the inductors connected and everything back together as it should be. You notice we're still missing the majority of the rail capacitors, but that is fine. The amp will still come on and work as intended with uh, limited rail capacitors. Um, obviously we'll fit those back in once we're done if this works. <clears throat> so yeah, don't think there's anything else I need to do just now other than fire her up again and pray that this works well. So let's take our probes and let's put one probe on the low side drain this side, one probe on the low side drain this side, bit of power. Okay guys, ready? Oh 
Oh yeah! <laughs> what are you saying, girl? Absolutely awesome. Yes, that is wicked. Fucking awesome. And they stay cold as well. Awesome. I'm happy with that. That is a repair. That is a fucking wrap. So that was... That was 3 hours and 15 minutes I think I've been live for now. So that was 3 hours and 15 minutes for one resistor. Do you guys want to see the size of the issue? <laughs> that tiny, this tiny little thing, okay. If you'd have hooked up the amplifier to the car with the new FETs in and everything and tried to turn it on, the whole fucking thing would have burst into flames. Not kidding. That is not a joke. The amplifier output section would have fucking exploded if you had put this in a car with this faulty resistor on the driver board. Just by changing that faulty resistor on the driver board, have we turned an exploding amplifier, uh, a ticking time, you know, a fucking booby trapped amplifier into a fully functional bass amp? Just that tiny fucking thing. So yeah, I think we're going to wrap it up. We're going to wrap it up for this evening. Uh, yay, successful amp repairing. Thanks for sticking with me for this amp repair. And I will get Jayan to edit this big ass video so you guys can watch it back if you missed it and see all the crazy stuff that we tried to make this thing work and what it ended up being. So uh, yeah, pretty cool evening, I think. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, have a good evening. Oh, my DDZ4s are in the fucking UK. I will go and pick them up on Friday. So I'll be taking my DSLR camera with me to Cambridge on Friday and I'll be videoing the unboxing of my DDZ4s. We're going to do some uh, free air testing and I'm going to video how the fuck we put them in my van because that is going to be a massive challenge and very fun video because we're going to have to unbolt the motors screw the baskets down to the enclosure and then put the motor back on the woofer and bolt that down whilst it's in the box. Yeah, I know. That's going to be a super funny video because it's a nightmare. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and that will be uploaded in a couple of weeks' time, I imagine. So until then, take it easy. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening. So yeah, after all of that... After all of that repair, um, I assembled it the next day and did some endurance testing on it. And I bumped the voltage up to 14.4 volts because that's what he's going to be using it in the car. And within five seconds of operation at 14.4 volts, the output fence exploded in my face, about eight inches from my face. It scared the shit out of me and sparks and bits of fence flew past my face and hit my arm. Um, <laughs> so it, uh, what's interesting was, is that I was like st sitting there with my head in my hands like, what the fuck? We got like, I was convinced we had it absolutely perfect in the video. And we did, we did have it perfect. The repair was perfect. What I had not realized is that the whole time that we were turning the amplifier on and showing you that it was dumping the rail voltage from the caps through that low side bank of FETs, it was actually slowly killing the FETs as it dumped the power through them. And it was slowly, slowly reducing the um, the voltage, the, the high voltage rating of the FET lower and lower and lower. The more times we dumped the cap voltage, the cap capacity through those FETs. Um, what actually happens is what, after the FETs exploded, I looked at them and I, I realized what had been happening. If we take a look at one of these FETs here, you'll notice that obviously you've got the die there and then there's like a dent in the middle. As you see that dent there, that's like where it's arced through the layers of silicon. Um, so what's been ha that only happens under huge current drain through the FET, right? So what has been happening is Every time we dump, every time we were turning the amp on to show you the problem and the capacity from the capacitors was going through those low side FETs, it was probably making a small dent every time in the silicon layers so that they were kind of closer together and or, or they were like, they were closer to shorting out. So um, as soon as the voltage went up above a certain threshold, um, it was able to arc through the silicon and explode the FET 
uh, which is what happens. So um, the amplifier is is fully functional again now. Um, all it required was that bank of FETs being replaced because we had fixed the drive circuit. The, the amplifier was technically fixed, but because I had been constantly turning the amplifier on and on and on and dumping the power, dumping the power, dumping the power to show you guys what was going wrong with it and to find out what was going on with it, um, I was killing those FETs that were in there. So replacing those FETs that were in there solved the issue completely and I've had it running for two hours now, 14.4 volts, dumping some big power into my dummy loads and it's very, very happy. So yeah. Thank you for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed, uh, click subscribe, click the bell button to be notified when I'm next live, and I'll see you next time.